pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your provision in our life. Spirit, soul, and body, Father, you care for us. And Father, sometimes we get distracted and we think that it comes from the left or from the right, from a job or from a person. But Father, it's your hand working in our lives. So Father, we put our gaze upon you. We reset our focus upon you. And Father, I pray that this morning you'll speak to us, you'll transform us, you'll change us. But Father, we desire to be more like you. Father, I pray that this worship that we gave you today is pleasing to you, Father, that it's the beginning of a week of worship to you. But Father, you have given us only reasons to be worshipful and grateful for your goodness in our life. So, Father, work in us today. Draw us closer to you today. In Jesus' very precious name, everybody say amen. Let's give God some praise. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Now, I know when you go to a football game, do a little bit more than that. When your favorite rock band came out on the stage back in the day, you let it loose. Jesus doesn't want your Tiger Woods golf clap. He wants you to praise him right now. So one more time, let's give God some praise in this place. There we go. That's worth it right there. Amen. <laughs> Very good. Well, if you can do me a favor, turn around and say hi to somebody next to you and you grab your seats. everyone, Maddie here, and we hope you've enjoyed the service so far. If you're new to City Point, welcome! You can learn more about us by texting the word welcome to 972-460-9235. You should receive a text prompt, and once completed, our team members will reach out to you and answer any questions that you may have. Last Sunday, after one cancellation and several delays, our mission team finally made it back from El Salvador in one piece. It was such an amazing experience to serve people and see God work. But don't just take my word for it. Check out what others had to say about the trip. When we went to the village of Komosagua, we were able to pray for the people there. Um, and Andrew and I got to pray for this lady that she came in with shoulder pain and knee pain. Um, and so we prayed for her shoulder first. And so she showed us kind of when we got started that this is basically like, she just had like a little bit of range of motion and it hurt really bad. Or at least she was like, it looked like it, she was in a lot of pain. So we prayed for her. Um, and then we asked her if it felt any better. And so it went from here and then she lifted her arm about here and she was still in pain, um, but it was more mobility. So we were like, okay, that's awesome. Let's pray again. So we prayed for her again. And the next time we pray, we're like, okay, how do you feel now? And she moved her arm up here and then she was still in pain, but it was visibly a lot more mobility than she had at the beginning. And so we're like, all right, okay, cool. Let's pray one more time. And so we prayed one more time, and when she was done, or when we were done, we were like, okay, how do you feel? And she immediately raised her arm all the way up, and she said that she was pain-free. Um, and so that was just so amazing to like see God working in her, and you could see in her um, just the miracle and the freedom of not having that pain anymore. Like this is stuff that I had grown up seeing when I was younger, but not necessarily like immediate healing. Most of the time it was, like especially in America, it was over time through doctors and getting to come here and see it so immediate and, and literally seeing people who were limping or couldn't walk in the room normally, their back hurt, were standing up straight, being fine and like walking out of the room. So I think if anything, it stirred up my faith to believe that miracles do happen in the US. They happen all across the world. So now when I pray for people, I feel like I have this new sense of, no, the Lord will do it. Like whatever doubt I had, he's gonna do it for you. He did it for them, he'll do it for you. Um, I would absolutely recommend this mission trip. It has grown my faith. Um, 
um, and shown me that God is a God of miracles and he desires to show up and have a relationship, a personal relationship with you. No matter how minute or small you might think it is, God really does care and he wants to have that that um, revelation with you, that moment with you, and then in turn, for you to go out and preach the gospel to others around you. Whether you're praying for us or have been giving to City Point on a regular basis, you played a huge role in ministering to the people of El Salvador. If these stories really touched your heart, you should seriously consider joining us next year. Look out for dates and details to be revealed in the coming months. Now back stateside, a huge thank you to everyone who participated in this year's Serve Day. We were able to partner with multiple organizations that make a huge impact in our area. Make no mistake, your simple acts of selfless love have opened hearts to Jesus and have made a huge difference in our city. And if you missed out, you should feel bad. No, I'm just kidding. We'll have other opportunities for you to serve later this year. Just make plans to participate next Serve Day in July of 2022. Lastly, keep the summer fun going by joining us on Sunday, July 25th. We're inviting the Kona Ice Truck back to help us stay cool in this Texas heat. As always, fun games and activities will be happening for all the kiddos. So invite your friends, family, or neighbors for an awesome summer Sunday at City Point. All right, let's continue the service and invite Pastor Eddie as he finishes up our series, Above All Else. Welcome. Welcome to City Point, wherever you're at. Uh, we're glad you're with us today. Just want to follow up on a couple things on the video announcements. Uh, Serve Day was incredible. If you missed out, I know you're sad about it. We're going to work on creating monthly opportunities to go and serve some of these organizations that, that can facilitate monthly volunteers. So keep an ear open for that. Uh, it was such a beautiful thing to see God's people at work uh, in our city and area. The next thing I want to do is Wally Cook. As you know, we, we had a mission team go to El Salvador, as they mentioned. Uh, Wally is one of the missionaries that we support on a monthly basis. And so he kind of sent me a private message bragging on our team. And I thought I would share it with you and make it an unprivate message. He said this, hey, guys, I just want to thank you for sending the team. They made a lot of friends and represented your church really well. I also thought that Maddie did an excellent job leading the team. American Airlines threw her several curveballs and tough stuff that she, had no, that she had no control over, but she got it done. I was proud of her and your team, too. Uh, one of the best teams we've had in a while. We love you guys, Wally. So let's give, give our team some props, give them some love for all their hard work. What a great thing. Uh, definitely international travel with group has changed since COVID. And so it was an adventure uh, for those, for everybody involved. Uh, today we're going to finish up our series called Above All Else. We're taking a look at our heart. Uh, I hope it's highlighted something to you and hope you see something about your heart maybe you didn't see before. And then next week we kick off a series called Good Vibes. And we're going to be talking about uh, what God does in our heart. There's something that scripture says the Holy Spirit produces in us. And there's some things that are not emotional they're spiritual, but they affect every part of our life. And so I can't wait to open that series up next week. So today we're going to jump into our series called uh, Above All Else. And we're going to look at the verse real quick, Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, guard your heart. Above guarding anything else, your bank account, whatever it is, he says, guard your heart. He says, from everything you do flows from it. Once you realize the power of your heart, it changes, I think, your life. Because you don't have problems, you have a heart situation. And the way you see things, really critical to what you do with your future, you interpret the actions of others through your heart. 
You interpret your future through your heart. And if your heart's not healthy, you're going to interpret other people. You're going to interpret events. You're going to interpret stress. All these things in an unhealthy way that may lead you to a path of brokenness. When God has made it clear that he wants to make our hearts soft and he wants to be pliable and he wants to transform us and strengthen us and make our hearts new, your heart is the doorway to everything God has for you. Every blessing that he has travels through your heart on its way to your life. And so I want to finish up this series today. Uh, Today we're going to look at King David. And we we looked at last week King Saul, and I don't have time to kind of go over that, but I would say it's one one of the key messages to this series, especially going into today. A wise scripture says, one of the saddest scriptures, that God regretted making Saul king. And he, his, his heart was the main issue with God. And so today we're going to look at somebody who's the exact opposite of that and why God chose this man over another one. And so let me pray and we'll jump into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. I thank you that it's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. We invite you, Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus said you would do. You would come and bring this word alive and apply it into our hearts. So, Father, we understand spiritual growth is not a mental exercise. It's a spiritual exercise. So, Father, we open our heart and we position our heart to receive from you. I pray that, Father, what we hear today, we receive it as something you want to do in us. And that, Father, we receive it with the flexibility of spirit to grow in you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So, Acts kind of gives a synopsis of what happened between King Saul and King David. It's right here in Acts 13. It says, then the people asked for King gave them Saul, the son of Kish, the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. David would be the second king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything that I want him to do. Uh, When I read that scripture, that one's just as shocking to me as the scripture that said God regretted making Saul king was that God found David. That God searched the hearts of men all over the planet to find the next king of Israel. And he said, I found in this one guy the heart of David. Which lets us know God looks into our heart. That God looks past what men see and he sees something unique about us. And then he says, the reason I like this one is he's a man after my own heart. So I want to do my best today to give you four things that I see is represented a man after God's own heart. Because these are the things that were opposite of what King Saul did. And I hope that we can learn from them. I know it's probably one of the most challenging messages I'll preach in this series. Because really, I think all of our goal in life, if we're a follower of Christ, is to have a healthy heart, not to have an unhealthy heart. And so to do that, we have to have a standard of what healthy looks like in our life. So when God went shopping for a king, he wanted someone with a heart like his. that was powerful, yet humble, that was compassionate, yet strong. And so the Lord uh, directed the prophet Samuel to the home of Jesse. And Jesse was a a father of many sons. And so when when the prophet showed up, a lot of fear for most people when the prophet showed up, because normally he brought, he could bring judgment or he could bring blessing, but he never brought just a, hey, how's it going, right? So when he showed up, he lined up all his sons. He said, I want to see all of your sons. And verse 6 records in 1 Samuel 16, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. He just looked at this young man and he said, this guy looks like he could be a king. He looks like he could carry the mantle. But then verse 7, the Lord brought a correction. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. If you remember the story of Saul, Saul was like a head and shoulders above everybody else. And he looked the role of a king, but his heart wasn't the heart of a king. For scripture says of Saul, he said, I rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. We look at the car they drive, the home they live in, the successes they've had in life. That's how we judge people here on planet Earth. God says, I can see way past that and see to the true character of a person. There's a scripture Jesus said where he said in, the, in, in, the end time, in, the, in heaven, the first will be last and the last will be first. There's people that got way ahead here on this planet living really nice homes, but they fail God miserably in the way that they live. He says, those will be last. But there's these quiet saints who do the will of God and are found faithful in what they do. He says, those guys will become first. And so I want to encourage you in this life, never measure yourself. And I know it's tough by the world standard. You measure yourself by the scriptural standard, and that's how you succeed in God's eyes. And when God was looking for what David was, he wanted to find a man that would succeed in the ways of God. 
David, in fact, was not on his dad's radar. When dad called up all of his sons, he did not include David in that. Now, there's some scholars that believe, and there's a couple psalms that kind of hint to the fact that maybe something took, past, took place with David's conception that would, allow, that would put his dad to make him be out in the field. Because most scholars believe Jesse was rich enough that his sons would not be the shepherd of sheep. But they, they would not, that would not be the role. That's typically the role of a servant, especially when the prophet, the most important person in Israel, came to visit you. You would want all your, your valued sons and your children in the room. And so for David to be left out there, it's a statement in and of itself that dad didn't even think David was worth calling in from the field. And so verse 12, it says, Samuel, when he saw him, said this. He says, so he sent for him, which was David, and brought him in. And he was glowing with health, and he was fine appearance, and he was, had handsome features. He was a good-looking dude, right? He could, he could Instagram post some stuff, right? Um, the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He says, this is the one. And so there is David, the youngest of his brothers, the shepherd out in the field, comes in, runs in. What's going on, Dad? The prophet says, this is the man. This is the man that has my heart. And so I want to look today at David's heart. And I want to look at four things that, I, in my opinion, based on looking at the stories and the contrast of the two, is why God says, this man's a man after my own heart. The very first thing I want you to understand about David, and I think it's a heart that God wants us to have, was it was humble and it was a repentant heart. Uh, David definitely made mistakes. If you read the story of David, if you've never read it before, I encourage you, find it in the scriptures, read it in the message translation. It reads like an incredible novel. David made mistakes. He sinned. He had some bad moments. He, he failed God. He failed his country at times. But when God confronted him, David would weep, David would repent, and David would change. He was humble about his failures, and he made sure those cycles did not repeat in his life. It's hard for any of us to go through life without failing, making mistakes, and sinning. And David was no exclusion to that. David did that. But the way David handled that was differently than the way he then saw. So a healthy heart does this. It makes mistakes, but it seeks change. You may think, well, I'm not, I, my heart's not good because I fail. No, a, heart's, a heart can be good and fail. That means you have a weakness there. But, it also, but when you come back to that weakness and say, God, I want to change, that's a healthy heart that says, God, I failed here but I want to grow. See, the idea that we'll be perfect one day is not a realistic goal for us as, as human beings, but what we can be is humble and repentant and changeable. God desires to have a healthy heart so that our mistakes don't turn into cycles. And I need you to hear that this morning. A healthy heart sees a cycle in their life and says, I need to stop this. This thing is damaging because that's what Saul did not do. When, when David was confronted, he would admit it, he would confess it, he would quit it, and he would change. That's, that was humility. When Saul was confronted by it, he would blame others, blame God. He would keep doing the behavior, and the behavior that got Saul taken off of that throne was something that God confronted him on, but Saul never broke the cycle, and that's this. An unhealthy heart makes mistakes, but defends its behavior. An unhealthy heart says, well, it's their fault. It was my situation. It's the home I grew up in. I don't need to change. It's all the things around me, and that was the argument of Saul. That's why Saul, God couldn't work with Saul's heart. Sever, Saul never truly changed directions. He never, when confronted, would change his behavior. Instead of saying, I blew it, he said, they did it, and he blamed others. And this is the truth about our heart change, is we can't change what we don't own. If you don't own what you do, you can't change what you do because the power of who you are is in everybody else's hands. That's good, y'all. Y'all, I, I impressed with that. I, I thought that was good. God is looking for ownership for us to have heart change. A healthy heart fails at moments, but grows over a lifetime. An unhealthy heart fails over a lifetime and pretends it's just a moment. And this is where heart change has to take place in our life. When we repeatedly have cycles of failure and of sin in our life, but we refuse to admit that it's a cycle and we pretend it's just a moment, we will never change. But a heart that changes sees an event and says that needs to change. And so over a lifetime, those moments get smaller and further apart. And there's a cycle of change and growth that takes place in your life. At some point with God and with people, an empty apology with no change stops working. And so with Saul, that's what took place. The kingdom literally fell through Saul's hands because he had empty apologies with no change of heart. 
Well, that stubbornness cost him. It cost Saul his throne. Stubbornness will cost us a marriage. It'll cost us financial status. It'll cost us jobs. It'll cost us leadership. It'll cost us respect. It'll cost you your anointing. God will stop using your life because of it. It'll cost you God's blessing in your life. I've seen it play out in lives where there's, there's nothing's ever their fault. It's always their boss. It's always their spouse. It's always their parent. It's always their pastor. They're just misunderstood. They were misread. But everybody else who saw it went, ah! And when we allow that to take place in our life, that stubborn heart just justifies and defends and blame shifts, but it never settles into the fact I need to change and I need to grow. In extreme cases, what I've seen, a heart that does not change, that takes a cycle and makes it a pattern and doesn't change it, is the only way they can change is they change relationships. They change churches, they change marriages, and they keep changing jobs. The problem is they keep changing because they never change themselves. Now, I know this is a tough one. I, by tell, looking on your faces, some of you are like, why are you saying this right now, Eddie? I was happy before I came in here. I'll tell it to you this way. I remember there was this <clears throat> couple, as far as here, that was kind of, they got married young, were in love, built this life together, were financially getting successful. And so uh, she decided that it was time for them to really build their dream house. And the husband loved the neighborhood, loved the house they were in. He had family close and good relationships with all the neighbors. And so they, so what they do with this tension? She wanted it. He didn't want it. You know, did they, did they kind of go and they just fight about it and turn into name blaming? No, they put it on, a, on the middle and they say, you know, let's just pray about it a year. Our marriage is more important than a stupid house. And let's just pray and see what God does. No, they did what everybody else does. They fought about it incessantly. She's, and they turned into something in their marriage where all of a sudden they finally through a period of, and it turned in from like we want this house to like you're always this and you're always this. And finally the husband yields and they get this home. But two years later they did so much damage to their marriage in the process of getting this home. They got divorced and they had to sell the home because neither one could afford it as a divorced person. Now where, how does that have to do with Saul and David? I'll tell you. The heart of David would see that moment, that contention, that strife and just said, you know what? Let, let's pause. Let's pray about this. I know it's important to you, but we need to be in agreement if we're going to be married because the junk that we buy in life really doesn't matter. I was at the ACO warehouse for a little bit yesterday along with a team of people. They were there. I came after they came, and I was looking at this warehouse, thousands of square feet of everybody's stuff that they've given. Stuff 10 years ago, they're like, baby, we got to get this for the house. It is incredible. They were going to decorate our house, and now it's sitting in a dusty box in a warehouse given away to somebody. I'll say this to us as Christians. We need to remember that everything here is temporary and it's not worth fighting about. None of it. I've been to a lot of funerals as a pastor and I haven't seen one, uh, one casket with a house in it yet. I haven't seen one car, one boat, one fish. Well, a fishing pole once, but, but that's it. And so for this couple, all of a sudden, the, the heart of David says, you know what, this isn't right. Look, what matters is that we, we fix this, we fix our relationship. The heart of Saul keeps pushing in that hard corner and destroying what's healthy. And so when we have that kind of heart in our life, the, the language of true heart change is this. It's humility. We own what we said. We own what we do. We apologize to God. We apologize to the people that we hurt. If we don't own it, we can't change it. The next thing I saw about David, which, which I just gravitate towards and I love, is he had a faith-filled and a courageous heart. David was known for his incredible courage. David was not reckless. David was not naive. David was not ignorant. He just knew what God can do. And there's a difference. And I think sometimes people assume people of faith are either naive or they're ignorant. But what faith is, it's being filled with a courage and a belief that God can do all things. Naive people have no idea how badly something can go. Naive people make bad assumptions and just hope it works out. The, the naive think that have no idea how big the enemy is. And the ignorant think no idea of how bad it can be. And that's not faith. Ignorance, it, faith is not ignorance. It, it, it's, it's, it's not lack of information about something and just say, well, I hope it works out. Faith is the ex exact opposite. Faith is trusting God with what you know. Some assume that, that faith is just that same thing. It's just ignorance and naivety. Na, na, t, anyway, I was about to say na, nativity, but it's not a nativity either. <laughs> anyway, but what faith is, is faith is the opposite. What David showed us was faith goes and looks in the eyes of the giant. Faith looks at, knows how bad it is. Faith knows how poorly it could go. Faith knows how quickly the cancer can spread. Faith knows how hard the recovery is an uphill battle. Faith knows how much debt is overwhelming and how bad the marriage really is. It knows how bad the business is. It knows how deeply the broken heart is. And faith looks at those things with all of its reality and says, but God can. Yes. 
That's what faith is. It's not ignoring it. It's not turning your back on it, hoping it goes away. Faith is going toe-to-toe with it, staring it down, up and down, saying, you're not bigger than God. God can take care of this. Faith is not afraid of facts. It's not an absence of knowledge. It doesn't need to be sheltered. It doesn't need to be uh, censored. Faith is a giant that stands in a room and dwarfs anything else in front of it. Faith is something to see things so clearly that it gives God pinpoint accuracy of where he needs to touch it. Never be be afraid of information and you think it will hurt your faith. It should build your faith because you know exactly what God's going to do. And so when David ran across his giants, faith fueled his life. Faith and fear see our life through one lens. Fear says this, this is the worst case scenario and it will probably happen. Faith sees it and says, I don't know what can happen, but I know God is with me. And we get to choose what lens we see life with. Do we see it through faith, feel courage, or do we see it through cowardice and fear? Fear always gives you the worst representation of what your future can be. Where faith is different is it just sees what God can do. It may, not have the, it may not know exactly what God can do, but it gives God the space to do it. Even when it seems like it's all downhill, when it's all broken, it still says God can restore, God can rebuild, God can heal, God can make the bad things good. All things work together for good for those who, are, who love God or are called according to his purpose. Faith sees something. It's not blind to everything. So we know with David is that he fought lions and bears. He fought Goliath. Scripture even gives us detail of how well he saw Goliath. He said he could see that the armor that on David's giant body weighed 125 pounds. He could see how you couldn't get to any vital organs with any weapon on his body. He saw the weight of that spearhead, which was 15 pounds, but David ran out there with five smooth stones because he believed something about a God that he served. He wasn't blind to Goliath. He saw Goliath clearly, but he saw his God stronger and bigger than Goliath. And this is what he said to to Goliath. He says, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of, of, of of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Scripture goes on to tell us that David defeated Goliath. But then in 1 Chronicles, it goes on to tell us the stories of all these nations that David defeated. It's an incredible chapter about the Amorites and all the armies that he faced. And at the end of this chapter, there's just one statement in verse 6 that says this, or in the middle of this chapter, it says this, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David was never known to not look at the enemy and not look at the obstacles and not look at what the problem was out there. But David always chose to get in the battle with God on his side, and you can never win a battle unless you're willing to fight it. And faith allows you to get into the battle, to stay in the grind, to stand your ground, to stare at your enemy, to fight for the people you love, fight for the promises of God in your life. It doesn't mean you back away in fear and ignore it. It means you stand up and you stare it down and say, my God is still bigger than you. And that was the heart of David. That's why God could bless David, because he was a fighter. And the life of God, David represented the heart of God. It says, I want to teach people by looking at the life of David that if God is on their side, nothing is impossible. If it was David's enemy, David taught us it was now God's enemy. All of us in this room have enemies, and it's not your mother-in-law. Right? It's not your neighbor that has way too much stuff in their yard. Are you that neighbor? That's a question. <laughs> it's the devil himself. And we have to understand that he doesn't come and show up in a shadowy figure in the corner of your living room. He shows up through the circumstances of your life. But we have to make a decision. I know everything I need to know about you, but I still know my God is bigger. 1 John 4.4 4 says this, You are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You wake up every day with this decision, God is on the inside of me, so I'm bigger than anything I face today. There's no way I can lose. Even if I die today, I still win because I'm in my Father's presence. Once that gets on the inside of you, church, you don't have a whole heck of a lot to lose anymore. It's all victory at every corner. A faith-filled heart just doesn't back down. It fights till the end. The next thing that I noticed about David to set him apart, and this one's probably challenging in our culture, especially even in the church culture, is his understanding of the anointing and leadership. Our world doesn't see this. In fact, our world has become increasingly blind to this, and I, have, I, I don't think it's an accident. It's not the spirit of Christ. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of this world. It's one of the reasons that David was great, is he honored what God honored. The second challenge really after Goliath, the big mountain for David, was Saul. 
Saul was the anointed king who's losing his kingdom. And as Saul was losing this kingdom and he knew it was impending David would take the throne one day, Saul became incredibly jealous. And his jealousy boiled over to an unhealthy place where David or Saul used the resources of Israel to hunt down David personally, not to judge him, not to discipline him, but in hopes of murdering, murdering him. The only advocate David had in the entire throne and kingdom of Israel was Jonathan, Saul's son, who wasn't able to spare his life but could warn him at moments when his dad was about to come and kill him. David was a warrior, but what Scripture records of David is that when this threat presented himself with Saul, David did not take on Saul. David retreated. Now, David was a fighter, and we know that. I just told you that, but what David understood is he's not going to fight God's anointed. He'll fight every other battle, but you're never on the right side to fight the one that God anointed. David ran, which was not his nature, but he ran for a reason. David had the right to hate Saul. David had the right to speak evil of Saul, but David never touched Saul. David decided he will not be triggered by Saul and become a victim. And I know that's popular in our society now that everything triggers us and everything. But when we give away our ability to be who we are and to live out the trueness of our faith and we hand that to somebody else, we're, we're victims. We're no longer overcomers. And scripture describes us as overcomers in this world, not victims on this planet. And what David made a decision was, I, I'm going to be who God called me to be. And there's not a person in heaven and there's not a person on earth and there's not a person in hell who can, who can make me move beyond what God has anointed me to do with my life. And so when, when, when Saul came in and encroached on this space, it, it's the story of Saul. Really, that, that part was, there's one part of the story where, where Saul had 3,000 armed soldiers hunting down a single man, David, who wasn't even king yet, and with the idea that they wanted to find him and they wanted to murder him. And so David and his men, and now David had some of his fighting men who when David ran for his life, these men went with him and they were loyal to him. And there's incredible stories in scripture about what these men could do. These men were more than enough to take down these 3,000 men. But they didn't. And so there David was. He, they decided to hide in this cave. Well, Saul had to go to the bathroom. Uh, he had to take a number two. And so he decided to go do that in a cave. So there David and all his men were further in the cave, which I'm assuming the wind was heading one direction. I'm just glad I wasn't them. And they're sitting in that cave while Saul is taking care of his business. And some bad advice comes to David from his men. He says, this is your day the Lord spoke to you of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands and you will deal with you as you wish. So David then crept unnoticed, and he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. David's men did something. They misused God's word. They weaponized scripture against God's anointed. See, this is the truth about God's word. It never violates the principle of his word. And sometimes people take things out of context in the Bible to use it to weaponize it against another believer, and that's never God. So David did that. But then verse 5 says this, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. And he said to his men, he said, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, then scripture goes in to say, David sharply rebuked. I don't know how a fighting man rebukes another fighting man, but I can assume sharply was a nice way of saying it. David sharply rebuked his men, and he did not allow them to attack Saul, and Saul left the cave, and he went his way. David made a decision that no matter what Saul did to him, no matter how many opportunities he had to hurt Saul, he wouldn't hurt him back. And he not only decided that for himself, but he decided if you're going to be around me, you're not going to carry that spirit either. We don't touch God's anointed. It's why scripture says, within, even in the church, he calls us all anointed now. He says that's why gossip and these things are so horrific in the church because they weren't born out of heaven. Heaven's an encourager. Scripture says the, the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. That whether we know it or not, one of the things that makes us great before God is our willingness to uh, honor the anointing of other believers and spiritual leadership in our life. Say, I don't know everything I need to know, but I'm not going to touch them. I'm not going to attack them. I'm not going to gossip about them. It's one of the reasons that David was great. He wouldn't attack the anointed. If it's a leader or it's a member, we have to remember as the body of Christ, they are anointed by God and loved by God and part of the body. That the inspiration to attack one another is not heaven-born, but hell-breathed. Now, David knew this. David knew that he would never fully walk in what God has for him until he could learn to honor others. David, even though God rejected Saul, David never attacked Saul. And that's the third thing I saw about David's heart is he was respectful 
and honoring of heart. He never went after Saul, though he had plenty of opportunities to do it. Now, what we also know about David is he not only honored his leadership, the, the ones that God was leading the nation at the time, but he honored those that were peers with him. And there's a beautiful story of David as they're hiding out and on the run from Saul that David wanted some water from his hometown, Bethlehem. And there must have been a well where the water was sweet and good. And David was standing one day, longingly looking, saying, I, I, I long for the water of the well at the gate of Bethlehem. And then three of his buddies, three of these mighty warriors did this in verse 16 of 2 Samuel 23. They broke through the Philistine lines. These three dudes chopped their way through a line of Philistines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, carried it back to David. And as they presented this to David, instead of drinking it, David poured it out as before the Lord. David understood the sacrifice and the love that each one of the members of his men had given that day. And rather than taking it for himself, he honored them forward and gave it as an offering to the Lord. One of the things that I hope among us as a church is that we can respect and honor one another in this house. That this is not a house of people. This is a house of God's sons and daughters. We are anointed by him. We are a kingdom of priests, and we must protect one another with our words and with our actions. David honored everyone, and he treated all, everyone with godliness and goodness. And church, I think we need that in our life. We need to, to say there are boundaries in our life. Just like David, I will not cross, and I will not hang out with people that do, because I believe that we're all created in God's image, and we're the body of Christ, and we're spiritual family. Ephesians put it this way. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths but only such is good for building up. He goes, if you're going to talk, make sure these words build up people as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So this is the instruction from Scripture when we talk to one another, that our words need to be gracious in building each other up, never tearing each other down. It's one of the reasons David was great, because I'm convinced of this. If David would have killed Saul, David would have never become king because he didn't understand the anointing that was on Saul. And he would therefore never understand the anointing that would rest on his own life. A heart that honors others is a heart that honors God. Y'all are really quiet right now. The last thing that sticks out about David to me is this. Is David had a worshipful heart. It's hard to read the Psalms and find a psalm that is not written by David. And you would think that these were all written in the great moments, but most of the Psalms were written in some pretty horrible moments of his life. David, in fact, was the one who said, I want to build you a temple. And God basically said, you've... You've been a man of war for too long. I, I can't allow you to touch and build this temple. He says, your son Solomon will do it. But David had this heart for worship and heart for the things of God. And David even cared for the Ark of the Covenant. His worshipful heart was in display as, as the Ark of the Covenant was returning to Jerusalem to the temple from the Philistines. And, and scripture says that David stripped down to his clothes and he just whirled about dancing before God, bringing the Ark in Jerusalem, leading the entire nation in worship. And he was so embarrassing to his wife, Michael, who was the daughter of Saul, which makes the reason, helps you understand why she was so critical of him. And she made fun of him for his worship. But here he is, David, the king of Israel, the mighty warrior David, the Goliath slayer. And he was not too afraid to make a fool of himself and worship God with all that he had. David, what we understand about David is when he lived, he lived a life of worship, and a life of worship is an obedient life. When we live an obedient life, it's a worshipful life because everything we do is worshipful to him. But once worship gets on the inside of us, it can't help but get out of us. And so David, when he brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, he was literally dancing before it and celebrating. Once it was in the temple, Scripture says this, then King David went in and he just sat before the Lord. The temple was there. His brow was wet with sweat as he worshiped God. And he says this. He says, who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? What an amazing insight. God, who am I that you would treat so well? For the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done great things and made it known to your servant. How great are you, sovereign Lord? There's no one like you. There's no God but you. You, uh, you, have, you have heard with our own ears. See, a worshipful heart is not just something that you do on Sunday. It's a lifestyle that you have. It's a heart that says, no matter what I face, I'm going to worship. And that's the fourth heart thing I noticed about David's heart in contrast to Saul's. He had a worshipful and an obedient heart. David was such a worshiper that even in the moments of his life, worship would flow out of him. 
There's a story in Scripture where Absalom, one of his sons, led his king in betrayal and literally dethroned and took over the kingdom of Israel. And Scripture says that David, this mighty king, the Goliath slayer, the nation conqueror, was running in shame out of his very own city of Jerusalem. As he's going, people are throwing rocks and mocking him. His son Absalom is sleeping with his wives on the roof of the palace to put to shame his dad and to let his dad know, I hate you, and I'm glad I'm taking over your kingdom. If that happened to most of us in this room, there'd be a Facebook post, I need prayers. I'm having a rough day. Cry face, cry face, cry face. Please help me. Not David. Not David. He was a worshiper. And when you squeezed him, when the pressure was on him, he worshiped. He didn't pity himself. He didn't retreat. He didn't go talk to people. He stood before his God, the the dethroned king of a nation. Psalm 63 records what he said. He says, you, God, are my God, and earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift my hands. Here is David, credible warrior, feeder of nations, dethrone, destroy Goliath. He's not too afraid to lift up his hands before his God and say, I will worship you. He was not, he was so much, he didn't care what people thought. He didn't care what people thought of his heart of worship. He just said, God, I worship you today. God, here I am in your temple. Your love is better than life. It's better than the, than the palace that I lived in and the robes that I wear and the wealth that I have, God. You are everything to me. You're, there's nothing more in life than just you. And if I lose everything but I have you, God, I still have you. I'll raise my hands in your temple. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest foods. With singing lips in my mouth, I will praise you. And then when I go to bed at night and my mind begins to wonder, I lead it back to you and I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. I can't sleep. I don't know what my son's doing, who my son's killing right now, God. I'm here on my bed with sleepless night, but what I let my mind do is I wonder back to you. And I remember your goodness. Because you're my help, I will sing in the shadow of your wings. And when the heat's on, when the pressure's on, I run to you and I find a place of worship. I cling to you and your right hand upholds me. Be a worshiper. It doesn't mean you have to have a series of successes. David would worship God in this series of failures. When Saul was hunting him down, when his son Absalom was destroying the kingdom, when his heart was broken, when the pressure was on, David decided the best thing to do in this moment is to worship. And there is a freedom in life when you disconnect from the circumstances of your life to find your joy, and your joy is connected to God. There is a freedom in life that the things of this world no longer hold you. And sometimes because we're so desperate and we're so broken, it's because we're so connected to our circumstances to find our joy. But David taught us something, and this is a heart that God wants us to have, is we're so disconnected from this temporary planet that we live on that even when everything goes downhill, even when everything shatters, even when the promises are broken and the, and the, and the liars lie and the people talk and, and all the things are falling apart, even when the diagnosis is bad, there's a heart that sits in silence before God and says, I cling to you and I worship you because you're all that matters everything else is temporary everything made can be broken but you cannot be broken you are a faithful God and I will worship you with my last breath there's a heart in David church that we need to grab a hold of in the day that we live in that if your worship for God is connected to events that that is a weak connection that's like a dial-up connection it is something that is temporary but a worshiper Good news, bad news, God's still on his throne. This is the truth, and this is the last thing I want you to walk away with. Worship is not for something God does. It's because of who he is. 
And when worship moves beyond your circumstances, when you can come into the house of God after getting fired, your dog getting run over, you had a flat tire, and your, and your milk went sour before you came to church. But you can say, I, tears running down your face, God, you're so good. God, I celebrate you today. God, I don't know what's going on in my life, but I know you're going on and you're good. That's the heart of a worshiper. See, a heart of a worshiper, you ever run across somebody and, and they're talking and then you mention something to them and they just go off with anger like that? Like it's so on the surface, you're like, holy cow, I'm sorry I brought that up. How about the cowboys? You know, you just, God wants worship to be so on the surface of who we are. How are you doing, man? How's your week going? Well, it's been a tough week, but man, God's so good. I know God's going to work this thing out. I don't know how. I just know he is. You just have worship. It's just right on the surface. You get in the car. Radio doesn't come on. You just fall into a place of worship. You come into church. It's like you're like a kid in Candyland. You're just like, man, they're singing a song. I don't even know it's a new one, but who cares? God's in the house. Worship. 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 Jesus shared a principle. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And David shares the same principle before Jesus did. He says, take delight in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Because as soon as he becomes the desire, everything else is added. But as long as everything else is desire, then why would he add it to you if it will become an idol in your life? There is a freedom church that we try, that band, Julie and the band calls you to every week. The freedom to live in a place of worship. You're grateful for that. As Jesus said, I'm grateful for those who cursed me and despitefully used me. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're teaching me, you're growing me in this. Because when you have that heart of worship, hell itself can't stop you. It can't shut you up. To die is gain because you're a little bit closer to worship central. It's Jesus. So these hearts of David, a humble and repentant heart, a faithful, courageous heart, a respectful and honoring heart, and a worshipful and obedient heart. I'm convinced if we say, God, let these things be true of me, that our heart beats a little bit more in sync in God, with God's heart than it does yesterday. Those are our, my prayer for us as a church. Is God, let us have a heart after you. Let's stand, and I want to pray for you. Like David, if you don't mind just lifting your hands here in the house of God. Father, we come to you right now. Father, your word is so true and so powerful. Father, though it can measure us, its grace also lifts us. Father, though it cuts away the, the, the waste in our life, it also adds value and power to our life. Father, I, I surrender my heart as a believer, as a father, as a husband, and as a pastor to you. But God, we surrender our hearts as a church and say, God, let our heart be something that you rejoice in. Father, let us be found as one who have a heart that beats in sync with yours. Right now, I pray for every person in here, God, if there is an area that they're challenged with today, the Father, that we learn from David is this, is that it's not a cycle we have to repeat. It's a place to repent and change. I thank you for the grace and the power to transform that's present here because of your Holy Spirit that none of us have to be somebody that we don't want to be in you. Thank you for that today, in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to give you the opportunity today that if you don't have a relationship with your Heavenly Father or you need to renew that relationship with Him, that you can begin that relationship today. Scripture says, and God made it super easy, super simple, because He so loves you and so desires relationship with you, he wanted anybody who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved. I'm going to pray a prayer in this room, and if you say, Eddie, would you include me in that prayer? Would you lift your hand real quick so I see who I'm praying with today? Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Others, you say, that's me. Why don't you lift it up? You can put it down. That's awesome. I want to say this prayer with everybody who raised their hands here and also with those who are online. Just say this simple prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of my sins you be the Lord of my life, and I choose to follow you with all of my heart from this day forward. I love you, but I thank you that you love me first. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Let's give God praise for those that made that decision. That's so awesome. You don't know how happy you made me today. This is going to be the best day of my week because of your boldness to make that decision today. And all I ask is that you take one of these little cards, text the word decision, just let us celebrate with you. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to come to your house. I'm not going to email you a hundred times. I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to message you on Facebook. I'm not going to DM you on Instagram. Be like, tell me your story. No, I just want to celebrate with you. Let us celebrate with you. If you had a baby, you'd let us celebrate. You just got born again. What's, that's the best thing to celebrate in life, right? So amen. Uh, next thing I want to do, and then we're going to end today with uh, just a time of worship, is we're going to receive our offering. Uh, what a blessing it is to honor God with what he blessed us with. It's a real privilege uh, that God called us to a place of generosity. That he says, I'm not only going to provide for you, but I'm going to give you enough, more enough to honor me with that and take care of people and, and needs in our, in our community. I told you this at the beginning of the year, Scripture, God's been really working on me. It's something I'm praying for you, praying for us as a church, is that we have an abundance. We have a harvest of generosity here at City Point, which means if you're the givers of City Point, God's going to work through you. And so I'm praying over your businesses to be blessed and promotions at work and, and just God doing good things in you because God has more for us to do as a church. Stepping out this week with Serve Day, I was like, God, give us the resources to do more in our community than we've ever done before. Second Corinthians says this, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread to eat. In other words, he meets the needs now, but he also allows you to sow towards the future. In this same way, he draws a parallel. He will provide and increase the resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. So I want to pray over that today, that harvest of generosity. If you've never been generous and honor God with your financial resources, begin today. You'll never regret it. And I say that based on scripture and just on my personal experience as a person and as a pastor. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to give today, to honor you with what you blessed us with. I thank you that, Father, you're producing a harvest of generosity in this church and every individual that is willing to be a part of it, God, that you want to do something that is uncommon, that there's going to be testimonies of your goodness and your provision and your increase at City Point Church, Father. I thank you for that today in Jesus' name.